afternoon and welcome to today's event uh, organized by Hong Kong Youth, newly established Center of Contemporary China and the World, known as the CCCW, 3C plus W. I'm Li Chen, professor in the Department of Politics and the Public Administration and the director of the CCCW. I particularly wanted to welcome Two groups of attendees are in the audience here. One is the group of our students who are attending this seminar, even though this is a, a, what Hong Kong people call the reading period, what the Americans call the spring break. And the second is the cohort of journalists, journalists in Hong Kong, representing Hong Kong, the mainland, and also international media outlets. For a long time, especially over the recent years, journalists in China, and to a certain extent, overseas China uh, observers as well, refer to Liang Hui, who two sessions, as the window of China. There are several reasons for this. First, as China has become more comprehensively powerful, no matter where you are, and what you do, there's probably a reason for you to pay attention to policy moves or policy changes in Beijing. Second, it is evident that China is experiencing what I call a paradox of unprecedented challenges, namely economic slowdown, lack of public confidence, and the financial system vulnerability. This is on one hand, but on the other hand, un unparalleled strengths in terms of renew renewable energies, e-commerce, and the domestic tourism. It is interesting to reconcile such a paradoxical economic situation. So, at a time when it is uh, imperative that uh, many Western countries should know more about China, for various reasons, their channels for access have narrowed rather than broadened, and the myths and misunderstandings have increased. And finally, last year was the first year of recovery for China in the post-pandemic period. Some believe that China has already recovered from rock bottom, while others are more pessimistic. 2024 will be critical for China and the world's economic recovery. This is partly because our world is really surrounded by crises and a serious crises in green wars, climate change, AI penetration, economic disparity within and between countries, and the possible negative impact of elections of some major powers. We need to evaluate the prospect of recovery of the Chinese economy within the broader global economic uh, uh, landscape. We simply cannot find a more appropriate and a more authoritative panel of experts to address these issues than the one that the CCCW is honored and privileged to present here. Before briefly introduce each of them, I would also like to mentioned that the three of our CCCW non-Lenderton Distinguished Fellows are currently attending Yang Hui in Beijing. Uh, they are really quite respect, very respected public intellectuals um, uh, in China and also elsewhere. And um, so these, these people, uh, these three, uh, I hope that I will uh, be able to feature them in the future after their return. Today's speakers, all distinguished economists, come from diverse backgrounds and have uh, diverging viewpoints. The first speaker in our, uh, is my dear friend, who encouraged me to Hong Kong in the first place. I vividly remember our conversation and a number of conversations you know, uh, last year. Uh, he's a legendary Larry Lau, Liu Zhong Yi, formerly president of Chinese University of Hong Kong, and the distinguished uh, chair professor emeritus of Stanford University. His students really 
the, uh, around the entire world, in China, in North America, in Europe, and elsewhere, including Helen Chao, uh, with us today. Uh, if I provide his long list of titles, it will take many minutes, maybe five minutes, so I will um, uh, you know, just omit that. An international renowned economist, he has made a great contribution to fields of economic theory, economic uh, metrics, and economic policy research. He was also a member of the CPPCC, Zheng uh, Xiaowei, for a decade. And uh, Larry, we are so honored and thrilled to have you with us today. The second speaker is also my longtime friend, Helen Chao Chao Hong, uh, managing director and chief economist for Great China Bank of America uh, Research. Helen holds a BA degree in international trade from Berlin University, a school that I call the cradle of China's top economists. And a PhD in economic from Stanford University, where he's, when she studied and uh, uh, very long. Helen previously worked at the World Bank, Goodman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, among others. Helen is one of the most respected investment economists focusing on Asia. And uh, her regular analysis report what it must be for China watchers over the past uh, decade. When I was at Brookings uh, the year before, I shared with my colleague who is a very prominent economist, we all learned with the economy. Not surprisingly, her team has been ranked top four in the, in, uh, in the institutional investor or Asian research team for the past decade, from 2013 to 2023. And the third speaker, Sam Hui, is a China, chief China economist at the Goldman Sachs, based in Hong Kong, just like Helen, also based in Hong Kong. Sam Hui and Helen Chao happen to be Jin or Hao Jie, and um, um, the translated the name of female economist. Happy International Women's Day to you. And uh, I we work as an economist at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Very few Chinese or Chinese American working at the board. She holds a PhD in economics from MIT. She is a rising star in the new generation of investment bankers. When she was asked by the media who is her female role model, who is that the anchor woman and the managing editor of a PBS News Hour? Judy Walter. Actually, I was on her show three times. I'm very impressed by fairness and uh, deep knowledge. When you yourself are a role model for others in the field of now. The fourth speaker is my Hong Kong colleague and chair uh, <laughs> professor of economics, Zhu Xiaodong. Xiaodong joined Hong Kong U only a couple of years ago. Prior to that, he was a professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Toronto, where he taught, taught for 30 years. As one of the world's leading experts on the Chinese economy, his groundbreaking research on China's economy in the reform era has covered many areas, trade, finance, agriculture, employment, and the fiscal policy, and uh, many others. His writings have appeared in virtually all top economic journals in the world. Last, of course, not the least, um, Professor Yu Jingo, Associate Vice President of Hong Kong U, will serve as a moderator for today's discussion. After completing his graduate studies and teaching in both the United States and UK, Jingo joined a Hong Kong U in the year 2000. 24 years ago. Um, at Hong Kong U, Yingrong founded the Institute for China Business, known as ICB. A visionary leader in education, international business, geopolitical economy, and the technological competition. 
he uh, has been frequently invited to give speeches on globalization and the China strategy, among other wide-ranging wide -ranging issues. Ning Rong, thanks for your leadership and for um, agreement, agreeing to serve as a speaker and a moderator. Each speaker will give a brief presentation, probably seven minutes or so, and then we will have a panel discussion followed by Q&A from the audience. With my profound gratitude and respect to all the speakers, I would like the audience to join me giving a warm applause. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for your kind uh, invitation and introduction. Um, we are going to have the uh, four distinguished speakers this afternoon. Um, I thought when I accept this invitation as the moderator, it's an easy job. Just ask questions, then facilitate the, the discussion. I was told by Professor Lee I better to also give a few minutes sharing. So probably I will uh, take a few minutes of time to share my uh, thought. I think today's seminar is uh, very uh, important to all of us. Uh, because as uh, Professor Lee mentioned, this week thousands of uh, delegates uh, from all, all over China are uh, gathering in Beijing to discuss and uh, prove government's initiative. Uh, these two sessions, so-called two sessions, attract global attention every spring because we know the policy uh, initiated in Beijing will in should impact on global economy because China's economy nowadays is close linked with uh, global economies. China's GDP last year uh, reach 5.2 percent. This is, was very impressive. Uh, however, already people did not feel the uh, expected upper economic uh, bounce back, and the particularly consumption remains weak, and uh, the um, entrepreneurs did not even have confidence to invest. The foreign uh, direct investment to China has decreased. Uh, first time since 1998. Uh, this has uh, uh, imposed huge challenges to China's economic recovery. Uh, we also know that uh, China has a lot of issues now in terms of the uh, overcapacity, uh, sludge housing uh, market, as well as debt crisis. But this year, we also already heard from Beijing. They have set up very ambitious target for economic growth this year. 5%. This is not easy. Um, of course, our economists will share their thought, but to me, I think this is very ambitious. Uh, this is because, um, as I mentioned, China has a lot of issues now. Uh, particularly for the year of Dragon, we also feel that Dragon represents uh, good luck. That's why I just heard uh, last month uh, a license plate in Hong Kong with the letter D was sold more than 20 million. It's uh, unbelievable. Why? Because D means what? Means dragon, also means dollar, money, good fortune. Uh, however, I don't think D this year means a good, good luck for China. I particularly want to mention the problem faced by China with D, letter D. First D is deflation. Everyone knows that. China enter the deflation last summer. Uh, that is still a problem for Chinese uh, uh, economy. Uh, this, is, uh, this trend is in the stark contrast with all the major economies which have been hit by inflation, probably uh, opposite. So um, deflation is causing concerns on many issues, such as slow economic recovery, we can demand um, increasing unemployment rate, particularly for young uh, people, the college graduates. We all know this year again, there will be uh, more than 20 million graduates coming out from college. 
and also of course the uh, uh, government uh, debt. So the second D is debt. Um, China's debt to uh, GDP ratio also hit record high in 2023. Uh, we all know that the according to different various estimates, it has climbed to uh, almost 300 percent. So this is very high. The third D is the demographic crisis. Uh, in 2023, China's population aged 60 and over also reached uh, 297 million. That's kind of about 21% of uh, China's total population. So the fourth D is recovery. This trend started in um, Biden, no, in the Trump administration, has continued uh, under Biden administration, uh, which refers to the process of a decreasing interdependence between the U.S. and China. Uh, in a way, this uh, uh, fourth D now become another D, fifth D, the risk to emphasize on self-reliance. So the sixth D is uh, the globalization. Uh, by this, I mean the era of the post-Cold War globalization is over, is dead. Um, we all know that this so-called uh, pro the, the post Cold War globalization started in 1999 and 1991 after the collapse of the Union. Um, more accurately, in term, the term I first used uh, back in 2020 uh, during the COVID, I called the process as the uh, semi-globalization. Uh, I described the new global order led by the United States and China featuring the complete different the ideologies. So in the post-COVID era, we see a uh, new global supply chain is being formed by US led against uh, China. So this is the, uh, this is the, um, this is the very, this is evident, I think, in the uh, ongoing chip war between the United States and uh, China. So where's the new drive for China's economy? I think I already passed seven minutes, right? I better. <laughs> so I thought I'd give you five minutes enough. China's leadership now has uh, already uh, signed military and local government with a new task of unleashed so-called new um, productive force. China's striving for uh, self-reliance in science and technology. So this highlights the new need for new development model in uh, advanced uh, sectors. So I think we can summarize in three areas. Is one is A, another is B, the one is C. A stands for AI. AI industry in China is seen as the uh, strong rival to that of the United States. So there is growing anxiety, but in China, about the gap in the field of uh, AI between the two countries. So China is a very, uh, uh, very hard, working very hard, determined to process ahead of uh, with the development of a large language model, which is uh, very important for like chat GDP. We all know that the China see the big threat because during the Chinese year, this so-called open AI sort of all sudden coming out of nowhere. So China now uh, will try to uh, go ahead with this. Uh, uh, development of a generative AI system. The uh, second one, B, is called battery power vehicles. We all know that this has become China's new drive for exporting and also providing the new uh, 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 engine for growth. Uh, two uh, companies are very renowned for the one is in battery, another one is the uh, EV. We all know last year. First time, the uh, GYD uh, surpassed uh, Tesla as the first, the world largest the, uh, EV producer. Another one is uh, CTEL, uh, based in Fujian province. It is also boasting a global market share of 30% uh, of uh, EV batteries. Uh, they, have produ they, they have rebuilt two factories in Han Hungary. They were supposed to go to also US, but their plan was Call off. C is for chip. 
we all know that China's chip industry also facing the significant uh, challenge due to the U.S. tech um, crackdown. Uh, China's chip industry now is gaining momentum, particularly after the Huawei the surprise uh, uh, breakthrough in technology during the visit of the U.S. Secretary of Commerce last year. So this is was held a big victory for for China. So I mentioned uh, maybe a five area starting with a D that could be a threat and a challenge to Chinese economy, but also three area for China's new uh, engine for further economic uh, development. Um, so I'd like to invite now. I better stop here. I will really take too much of your time. First time, first I'd like to invite Professor Lau. Uh, he will provide his analysis on the prospects of China's economy in 2024 and beyond. Professor Lau, please. All right. Uh, first of all, let me say someone already uh, told you that the growth rate was 5.2%. Last year, um, I think you actually should think of it as really quite an achievement, okay? Because 5.2 percent growth will put China among the fastest growing economies, major economies in the world. Um, for 2024, um, the international organizations such as uh, IMF, World Bank, and OECD, they have all come up with uh, forecasts around 4.6, 4 4.5, 4.7%. .4 and uh, the five investment banks, including Goldman Sachs and DPS, they have also issued forecasts ranging between 4.2 and 4.9%, with a median of 4.7%, uh, 4.6%, I'm sorry. Um, the Center for Forecasting Science of the Chinese Academy of Sciences has actually issued a forecast of 5.3%. Um, Premier Li Chang announced a 2024 target of growth of around 5% at this year's two sessions. And compared to past growth rates, the, uh, since the economic reform and opening in 1978, this might seem very low. But, uh, but in fact, it isn't because uh, it is actually uh, very high. And we also have to take into account that in recent years, the Chinese government tends to emphasize the quality of growth in addition to the quantity of growth. And there has to be a trade-off. You know, you cannot really uh, be growing very fast uh, in both in terms of both quality and quantity. Um, now, my personal uh, uh, view is that 5% growth is eminently achievable. Okay. Uh, despite all the uncertainties, um, I don't disagree with all the uncertainties that Professor Liu has mentioned, but, uh, but I think it will be okay. I would actually make a slightly more optimistic forecast of a range that the rate of growth for 2024 would be between 5% and 5.5%, okay? depending on climate and other factors and whether there's sufficient aggregate demand. My forecast is really based on my estimate of the potential GDP, or what is capable of being produced. Um, in the following chart, I want to present a provincial map of China with different colors. And, and you notice that there's only one speck that's yellow, that's Tianjin. Tianjin actually has a uh, target growth rate for 2024 of 4.5%. Okay, everyone else has forecast, we forecast about 5%. And you can see that, uh, in fact, uh, about 20 out of the 31 provinces have a growth rates, target growth rates that are about five and a half percent. Okay, so it's easy to take uh, and wait to take away the average, and you would know that uh, it will come out to be about five percent. Okay, my calculation basically uh, gives about 5.41 okay? percent. So, um, uh, and I think that is actually quite reliable to look at also. The provincial targets. Now we want to identify negative factors. Some of them already mentioned, but we said the first one, I think that's the most serious and important, is insufficient aggregate demand. 
Second is a shrinking population. The third is the fiscal conditions of local governments. And the fourth is a China-US strategic competition. First of all, on the institution aggregate demand. China is a surplus economy. There is surplus labor, there is surplus capital, and there is surplus production capacities in almost every sector of industry. Okay. Now, what that means is that as long as there is demand, there will be supply. Right? And supply is not a constraint. Now, what is the evidence that there is a surplus economy? There was inflation in 2023, as, as Richard, you mentioned. Okay. In fact, the GDP deflator actually declined of a half a percent a year. That really shows that there's no price pressure on the demand side. All you need to do is to increase demand. So it is important for China to maintain an adequate level of aggregate demand. Now, as a large continental country, the economic growth of China, like that of the United States, is not sensitive to external economic disturbances. And in particular, it's not, not sensitive to the rate of growth of the this is not true around the year 2000, it is true today. And uh, net exports is really no longer a very important driver of Chinese economic growth. Now, I will show you a chart in a sec. Uh, the Chinese economy is still operating in the range of real GDP per capita, within which a 5 to 6% average annual real growth is possible. Okay. Now, is there any risk of Japanification? I mean, this is China be followed by three decades of stagnation, as Japan did after 1990. Um, I think no. I think the answer is that as long as China can maintain a sufficient level of aggregate demand, demand okay? um, the World Report at the two sessions also mentioned the expansion of domestic demand. The aggregate demand uh, for both consumption and investment about the future, um, and which honestly, right now, the expectations are not that rosy okay, among the general public. So it is important for the central government to try to turn around the currently negative expectations of both enterprises and households. Now, talk about shrinking population. Um, the population of China, as we all know, has been declining for two years in a row. And this is uh, really because of, uh, partly in part because of COVID, which increased the death rate. And also COVID actually decreases, has decreased the marriage rate, okay, for, for obvious reasons. And I think the latest report indicate that the marriage rates have begun to rise. And so it should change, uh, eventually uh, stop the birth rate from falling. But whatever happens, it won't have an impact for at least two decades. Okay, so this is not a, a serious uh, problem in the near term. But what is more important is that there is still surplus labor in the Chinese economy. The primary or agricultural sector today generates only 7.1% of GDP, okay? but employs around 24% of the labor force. What does that tell you? That tell you there's plenty of people Laborers, laborers who can still be moved from the rural area uh, to the urban industrial sector. And over the quality of the labor force, measured by education and life expectancy, which is an indicator of health, okay, has also greatly improved since 1978. Okay, we don't have time to look at it. But the other thing is the retirement ages in China were exceptionally early. Okay. They were all set in the 50s. In the early 50s, 50 for women. 55 if the woman happens to want to be a Catholic. Okay. Um, 60 for men. And by this time, it really turned out to be way too early. And, and also these two problems that you can support yourself for the rest of your life if you actually retire at 60. You're going to live too long. Okay. So, um, and if you think about it, there are currently six, 70 million people in China between the ages of 
60 and 65. And they can easily be organized if there is a real shortage of labor. So I don't think shortage labor is a problem. And I believe that the postponement of the mandatory retirement ages is really being considered by the central government. Now, uh, I want to show you this. this uh, the red line is a good birth rate. You can see that for the last couple of years, it's, it's really been declining. But the blue line you can see is actually the death rate that has been rising, especially for the last two, three years. And that is really a COVID effect. Now, the fiscal condition of local government. After three years of COVID, I, I think we can say that most of the provincial and local governments are in bad fiscal shape. They have to acknowledge that. They've had no revenue for a while, and they have all expenses because of their COVID. And, and in addition, uh, you know, uh, many of the Chinese real estate developers on which the local governments depend, they've gone bankrupt. Right. So, uh, and so basically, local resources are almost exhausted. Local authorities are not in a position to undertake new initiatives. I think that is a serious issue. But we have to recognize that we are not going to be able to handle the existing debts. Okay. So it is time for the central government to step in to either assume the debt or convert the debt. The whole idea is to let the local governments to have fresh start. It's just like bankruptcy. Okay, I mean, a firm is not going to make it. Just let it go. Okay, and so that you let it go back up so that you get a new start. And what is needed for local governments is basically a new start. Okay, and, and that's easy to do. The government can simply purchase those debts and, uh, and finance it with. Uh, my favorite is perpetual, <laughs> a perpetual bond. <laughs> okay. But uh, but even in the work report, there's mention of outer long bonds, and they are basically the idea that for something that lasted, and it, and it basically, for example, like a token, is once in a century of occurrence. Okay. The cost should properly be shared by the present. Not just simply by the current generation. <coughs> okay. Next, I want to talk about Chinese strategic, uh, strategic competition. I think that's the new normal. Okay, so we really should have any illusion that it will improve within the next five years. <coughs> you know, maybe in the five to ten years, it might improve. But I, but I tell you, it's nothing to, to worry about too much. A hard war between the former Soviet Union and the U.S. never broke out of the last century, despite their rivalry. Okay. Why? Because of mutually assured destruction, okay. MAD. Okay. All right. And this is still true today, okay. you know, because there's no more no hard war because the cost would be too high for both sides. Even if you win, you lose. Okay. So I, I am reasonably confident that's the case. But as the sole global hegemon, the U.S. really cannot allow any other country to say no to it and go unpunished. Because that would encourage others to begin to say no to it. Okay? But the so-called Chinese threat to the U.S. is definitely not existential. I don't think China has any intention of uh, uh, preventing uh, U.S. or converting U.S. into a communist country. No. I don't think there's any intention at all. Um, can U.S. suppression of Chinese economic growth through controls on exports and technology be successful? I believe it will have some short-term effects, but will not permanently prevent China's rise. There are actually many different ways of doing the same thing, as long as you know, especially when you know it can be done. Uh, let me give you an example from the last century. Uh, you know, during the Cold War, the former Soviet Union uh, really did never develop microelectronics. But they said, we may need to. We have the most powerful rocket in the world, and we can send our warheads anywhere. Right? But the U.S. did not have powerful enough rockets, so they specialized 
they have to do microelectronics to, to, so that they reduce the payload. So their missiles could also reach most. Okay. Now, the result is stalemate, but they did it in two different ways. Okay. They're not the same way. And I think many things, this is similar. Now, uh, decoupling or de-risking, I have a personal view that it's not a bad thing. Okay. It's really not a bad thing. Um, uh, by de decoupling means that instead of one supply chain, you have two. Uh, what do you gain with two supply chains? Okay, so we have one, why do we need two? With two supply chains, you eliminate the possibility of monopoly. And you're no longer being expected. You always have a second source, or even a third source. Right? And I think the competition between the two cha supply chains will actually be good for consumers and users around the world. And it will bring down prices. Just think about if we only have Boeing today, what what are we going to do? If you don't have Airbus, there's no choice. So choice is actually good. And decoupling and deficit is actually good. Uh, not all the bad. I mean, there's a short term effect, but it's not all bad. Um, let me uh, try to conclude with some long term projections of the Chinese economy. Um, I think in the longer term, um, of course, China cannot continue to grow at 10% a year as it did first 40 years of the same fall, but it were, it's actually still in the range of uh, the capital GDPs that would allow it to grow uh, at, uh, I would say, somewhere between 5 and 6 percent. Now let me show you this chart. Now, what is this chart? This chart plots the rate of growth of real GDP on the vertical axis and the real GDP per capita on the horizontal axis. The red points are for China. The yellow points are for Japan, and the blue points are for the U.S. Now, you can see that there's a general risk between a negative sloping relation between the two, which is basically what I'm trying to tell you, is that as per capita GDP rises, you know, measure GDP rate of growth will fall. Okay? And, uh, and it happens everywhere. There are many reasons. We don't, we don't have time to go into it. But, what I also want to point out is that China is actually still at 12,000, real GDP 12,000. So it is still operating at a range that is capable of reasonably high growth rates when Japan and the U.S. were in a similar position. Okay. Now, um, U.S. is now over 80,000. So you see that it is actually operating only in the range of um, uh, you know, around below 3%. So, so I think on the basis of this, I actually have made some uh, forecasts. But I also want to point out that, uh, uh, that two things. One is that these forecasts are sensitive to the exchange rate. Okay. And uh, you may or may not know that in the year 2023, um, the uh, renminbi uh, US dollar exchange rate actually have flipped by more than 12% okay, during the same year. That could make a difference because we are calculating everything in US dollar uh, at 2023 exchange rates. But I also want to add that um, in terms of purchasing power parity, PPP, international prices, back in uh, 2015, China supposedly already caught up with the US. And this uh, action finding was endorsed by the uh, IMF and the World Bank. So uh, anyway, I just want to uh, make that clear. Um, it, so this is really my forecast. You can see that the uh, cross the line will cross around 2038. Okay, plus or minus a couple of years. I mean, can be that accurate? But but that actually shows you the following: that is, China came very much from behind. The the columns are the rate of growth. Okay. So you can see that even though for many, many years, <coughs> Chinese growth rate had been much higher than the blue columns, and it continued to be under in terms of uh, GDP. Okay? And, and it will take, I think, another, uh, my estimate is 2038. It will probably take another uh, decade and a half to catch up. <coughs> now, uh, but in terms of per capita, 
is actually much worse. It's less than a quarter. Even at 2038, it's not uh, going to happen any soon. My personal assessment is that um, China may never catch up to the U.S. in terms of per capita GDP. And, and that is per, per capita resources, natural resources of China. Mineral deposits, arable land, clean water, and so forth, are much, much less on a per capita basis. And it may never happen. If it happens, it will probably be the end of the century, you know, long after my time. Okay. So let me just stop here. Thank you very much. Um, in view of the fact that we have a, um, you know, Dr. Shan coming through and talking probably more about the rest of the world as she planned to do, I probably would focus a little bit more on the two sessions in China and also the Chinese economy. Um, so actually in this past week, there has been a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm, especially from our friends in the media, talking about China's uh, NPC and especially the GWR, the Government Work Report. It was actually released on Tuesday morning during the opening ceremony, uh, read out loud by the, uh, uh, the Premier, Mr. Li Qiang. Um, in fact, I would say that uh, if I want to summarize uh, how we think about this particular, uh, you know, takeaway of that report. I would say probably I would say that I, I would call it there's no surprise on the upside or on the downside. Um, in fact, I wouldn't say that it's completely in line with what we have forecast, but relative to market consensus, I think that was pretty much uh, uh, you know uh, uh, in line uh, and a consistent uh, you know turnout. If we look at um, you know, what it was trying to, uh, to convey, I think it is trying to convey a picture that the government is going to continue to support overall economic growth by rolling out more stimulus measures, including on fiscal, monetary, property, you know, uh, and also to promote new high quality growth, and stuff. Uh, things that uh, we do not really understand very much, and maybe Dr. Shan can help us a little bit more. Um, but uh, overall speaking, this was still contributed to the uh, overall GDP growth target this year, which is said to be, again, flat at about 5.0%. If you look at this particular table, this is uh, what we expect the forecast the numbers to be for this year and next year. We are expecting GDP growth to, in China this year to end up with 4.8% uh, for the whole year. Um, so I would say that this number is probably slightly lower uh, than my professor, Professor Lau's numbers, but I would say we're close enough because in China, when you talk about uh, being around a certain number, right? In Chinese, we call it zuoyou, to the left and to the right. That means 20 basis points on either side, right? So that means as long as we fall somewhere, let's say between, you know, 4.7 to 5.3, we got that box checked. That's mission accomplished. So that is why we will say that if China managed to deliver a 4.8% GDP growth this year, that would be pretty much in line with what the growth target that has been set by NPC was indicating. Um, so, so far, do we see enough of the, uh, um, the, the policy measures being suggested by the NPC, very much contributing to such a, you know, a, a round 5% reading for the whole year? I would say that actually for 4.8, not to mention Professor Lau's 5% plus number, they might have to step up a little. We expect that they would need to do a bit more than what they ha currently have uh, uh, announced so far. For example, on the fiscal side, we were expecting a 3.5% uh, fiscal headline fiscal deficit number, combined with the one trillion special treasury bond issuance, the super long-term ones, and also possibly four trillion of uh, quota of the local government special purpose bond issuance. It turned out that we were a little bit too ambitious. And uh, we had the package coming in on Tuesday as the follow-up. Uh, on fiscal deficit, it came up with a 3.0, so slightly below our 3.5% number. And uh, for the, uh, um, you know, the special treasury bond issuance, that was a 3.9, sorry, the special purpose bond issuance, that was a 3.9 trillion uh, quota, as opposed to our forecast of a 4 trillion. So that seems to be a bummer, but I wouldn't say necessarily that this has disappointed the market significantly. 
because I think the market will probably be okay if you have a combination of these two, either as a 3.0% plus one trillion, or 3.5% plus no mentioning of special treasury bonds. So now we're pretty much uh, just doing the, you know, uh, having the combination of the, 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 the former, and I think therefore market is roughly okay with that. So this is probably, a, you know, pat, uh, kind of with a passing grade of uh, being really close to disappointing the market, but uh, not really doing that. And combined with the one trillion mentioning, right, the one trillion of, uh, of the special purpose bonds, I'm uh, sorry, special treasury bonds for this year, and maybe more multiple years going after, I think that's a commitment that, you know, the government will probably continue to put in more resources, um, you know, uh, yeah, from a fiscal perspective. And therefore, I think all in all, the fiscal package was okay. It's nothing super, well, you know, exciting for everybody to write home about, but uh, it's uh, not necessarily super disappointing either. So that's why I said that, you know, probably in terms of growth number, fiscal uh, targets, nothing was particularly, uh, you know, uh, too surprising on either side. But on the monetary side, what they said was pretty much very similar language compared to a year ago. Um, and uh, with a lot of emphasis on, on FX stability. You may see that over here, we have our USD CNY forecast um, standing at 6.9 by the end of this year and uh, 6.7 by the end of next year. Uh, this is where I have to put up uh, our little disclaimer to say that unlike uh, you know, Hui's team, uh, we at B of A do not, at economic research, we do not make forecasts of the, uh, of the uh, FX. So what I'm showing to you is actually what, what we borrowed from our FX strategist. In other words, if he was wrong, don't blame me. Uh, so, so our call is that we expect the USD CNY to go a little bit further towards 645 by the end of the first quarter. But then uh, by about mid-year this year, as a result of the Fed pivoting and then finally cutting, uh, our house view is still to cut uh, three times each by 25 basis points before the end of the year, starting from mid-year. Um, the, uh, the dollar strength is going to, to peak out, and finally we, we will see renminbi appreciation towards the end of the year to 6.9. So that's the type of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking behind our numbers. Um, well, the PBOC's, uh, PBOC's goal for monetary policy includes uh, the uh, emphasis on renminbi exchange rate. I also want to mention a little bit about what this means on the, uh, on the rates. Uh, a lot of uh, recent debate is on you know, where, uh, whether the policy rates are going to be further adjusted. We saw a, a, a five-year LPR cut by, 20, uh, by, uh, by 25 basis points recently. Um, but we didn't see LPR, uh, one-year LPR or MLF mana for uh, being cut. So that was a little bit surprising, let's say, relative to the Fed uh, you know, timing. Because given that there was this triple R cut in late Jan, and they pretty much indicated that they want to do more on the rate front, I would say that this is probably suggesting that you know, before the Fed is about to cut, we probably will see very li limited room for the PBOC to do more on short-term interest rate adjustment. Um, so that's actually uh, more about uh, you know, uh, where we see this year is going to pan out and also relative to uh, um, actually uh, what came out during the government uh, working report. Uh, let me just uh, quickly maybe uh, uh, move to a couple of things to mention um, why we think that uh, growth this year still needs a little bit more help and hopefully that will come along. So far, uh, oh, sorry, did I touch anything that it Anyway, uh, I will read out that. So we see dichotomy in this uh, economy at the moment in China, which is more uh, dis you know, uh, distinctively seen between con the consumption driver versus the, uh, the investment driver of the uh, economy. Uh, if you look at the consumption, I would say generally speaking, the momentum has been holding up relatively well. Um, you know, Partly this was uh, the so-called right? you know, people were saying that there is so much pent-up demand after the COVID relaxation, zero COVID policy uh, removal, to the extent that people will all rush out and try to uh, you know, do whatever they were not able to do. So we saw a little bit of that in uh, last year, but that seems to have petered out probably earlier than people were originally expecting um, you know, in the second quarter. 
we thought that this would probably carry on for a little bit longer, but in the end, um, you know, unfortunately, starting from the second quarter 2023, uh, the momentum was easing a bit. Within consumption, there was a lot of trend that you might have heard recently. People were talking about downgrades. You probably have heard a lot about uh, consumption downgrade. Uh, but uh, I would say that's probably because that you read much more about what people do in larger cities, especially tier one, tier two. Because it is famous to say that now in tier one, tier two, people want to downgrade their consumption, they want to cut back their spending. But actually in smaller county level, you know, uh, low end cities, it is a consumption upgrade. So, um, you know, actually people, <laughs> people were saying that uh, nowadays you can, you can even get the dai go, right? The, 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 those kind of on Taobao or on, you know, on Douyin, you know, these kind of professional uh, uh, you know, vendors who can buy from IKEA, from, you know, Hema Xianzheng, and from all these stores that are only existent in tier one, tier two cities, and then pass on to the county level cities. You can even dai go, you know, like a, a cup of, um, you know, milk tea uh, if, you, if you want to. Um, so, so actually, I think at the moment, it is not completely clear to us that consumption is a one-story rules-all kind of uh, uh, situation. We are seeing you know, some people probably cutting back on their spending, while others probably doing you know, spending a little bit more than before. And especially within consumption, I don't have the time to show all the charts that are over here today. Uh, we see, for example, between uh, the consumption of services versus the consumption of goods, uh, definitely a whole lot more momentum is seen in the consumption of services. For example, in the left-hand side chart, you see that over here, uh, this is the, uh, the number of tourists uh, in, mainland uh, in mainland China versus the, uh, the, the, the revenue of tourism uh, in the very important the Golden Week and uh, long, uh, long weekend holidays, as, opposed, you know, as divided by the same level of, uh, of uh, those series is back in 2019. So what is the most exciting is that by Lunar New Year this year, we have finally seen that the number of tourists and also the fiscal uh, and also tourism revenue coming, you know, coming back very uh, uh, outstandingly to 119% of where it was and 108%. So this is actually a, quite an impressive uh, gain relative to even 2023 well, we thought that people should be all coming out and try to uh, make up for what has been lost uh, during the COVID times. And also box office. I don't know how many people have been uh, watching movies uh, recently in Hong Kong. Um, I haven't contributed uh, uh, to that part of the GDP for a while. But uh, I'm glad that most people are not like me. And you can see that, you know, depending on how you calculate the, uh, you know, uh, Lunar New Year holidays, if you calculate it as an eight-day holiday and then, you know, uh, calculate the seven-day rolling uh, moving average, then, you know, what we saw this year was the second highest in history in terms of, uh, uh, you know, box office revenue. But if you're looking at the eight days, and then we're, this is definitely the highest in history. So actually, people are not necessarily cutting back on everything. They are spending more. They're spending on tourism. They're spending on transportation. They're spending on... Uh, on, on, on the, uh, the, the uh, you know, movie tickets. And if that is the case, this is probably suggesting that maybe the economy, there is a, at least a part of the economy that is holding up relatively okay. But at the same time, going back to what we said about the dichotomy, the, the, the CAPEX side is still relatively sluggish. If you look at these uh, high frequency indicators that we track, um, we actually found that, for example, uh, in terms of commodities, rebars, and also cement orders, um, you know, the, the dark blue line is showing, you know, what we are seeing on a weekly basis uh, this year versus where it was uh, in the past a few years. And, uh, and then you can see that, unfortunately, after Lunar New Year, that the orders were not as strong as uh, it usually would have been uh, in, other, in other years. So this is a reflection that Chinese, you know, for the Chinese economy, the investment driver is not necessarily doing that well. And uh, we still need to see a little bit more momentum coming through this year um, to actually at least uh, see, uh, um, to see the, the drag coming out of the, uh, um, you know, the, the property sector being a little bit less than before so that overall growth can still remain at about 4%. 
I don't have the time to go into details uh, about the property sector. Um, I hope that the Dr. Shan and the uh, later speakers will be able to say that, uh, say something about the property sector. Um, I would, uh, I would just uh, mention maybe one, uh, one last issue, which is uh, uh, confidence. Uh, Professor Lau mentioned that uh, confidence, expectation, is very important, and I think so too. If you look at the Chinese economy versus that in the U.S., right? Uh, in the U.S., you know, consumers don't have too much saving, um, and uh, and however, they are spending still very confidently because um, you know their expectation is very strong. They are confident about their future income. China is exactly the opposite. We look at China. And, uh, and we found that the households are saving so much more than before because they worry that their future income is going to come down, so they cut back on their current spending. Um, but is that going to be the case? Maybe their spending is their safe uh, income is not going to come down as much as what they fear. And therefore, overall speaking, you know, I would say that the current uh, weakness in consumer confidence has still been a major hurdle uh, because even for the this part of the growth driver that where growth is a little bit better than the uh, investment side, we still haven't seen a full-fledged recovery, uh, you know, as it deserved to see. Um, back, you know, in 2022, just as a reminder, what exactly triggered the sudden plummeting of this particular indicator, right? In April 2022, one thing took place, Shanghai lockdown, right? And uh, however, even by the end of 2023, when the whole country was taken out of that zero COVID policy, did they recover to where it used to be at 125? No, it did not. So this is suggesting that policy credibility is probably difficult to regain, but very easy to break. So we truly hope that in the near future, we could see a bit more um, you know, uh, uh, you know, help on the demand side, as Larry suggested. Uh, for the Chinese economy, and uh, you know, especially by uh, by by probably boosting the, uh, the consumer confidence, um, and, uh, and if, you know, we can therefore see more sustainable growth coming out of the consumption driver. Let me stop there and pass on to the next. Speaker. Thank you for listening to this webinar. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and Thanks very much for having me. It's uh, such a great honor to be included in this panel. Um, as Helen went through the two sessions and greater detail in Chinese economy, uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, um, summarize a few key research views published uh, on global economy, uh, in particular the U.S. and uh, Chinese economy. Uh, this is just a summary of our forecast. Um, there are a lot of numbers and people in the back might not be able to see. Uh, I'll just uh, highlight a couple of numbers. One is uh, U.S., we are notably above consensus. We still like uh, the U.S. economy. We think growth will be robust, 2.8% uh, for this year versus a consensus expectation of only 2%. Number two, China, we are slightly above consensus. Uh, actually, we're in exactly the same as uh, uh, Helen's number, 4.8% uh, for this year's real GDP growth, uh, also in line with uh, what Premier Li Qiang said about around 5% growth. Uh, number three, if you look at the very bottom line, versus a consensus which expects a slowdown in global growth from 2.7 to 2.3, we're expecting stable growth 2.7 to 2.7. Now, on the U.S., uh, this is the proudest chart of uh, GS macro research. Uh, you look at the, throughout uh, the cycle, the past um, you know, 12, 18 months, we've been always saying the U.S. is not going to get to, into a uh, recession. And it uh, seems like consensus is moving in our direction now. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't change our forecast. You can see March 2023, when uh, regional bank stress took place in the U.S., uh, we did raise the 12-month recession risk um, uh, uh, around that time. Uh, but overall, our view has always been the cycle is different. Uh, COVID-induced um, you know, boom and bust is very different from a traditional business cycles. Uh, you shouldn't be using the same framework analyzing this cycle. Um, at this point, the uh, uh, recession probability that we're assigning is 15%. Uh, 
which is similar as the unconditional probability for 12 months ahead recession uh, at any given uh, point of time. So we don't think the U.S. is heading into recession. On inflation, we're still of the view that U.S. inflation will continue to decline. Um, you know, the dark blue line shows a young year, light blue line shows a six month average of a sequential. Uh, sometimes we like to look at month over month uh, rather than year over year because year, year over year is more lagged. Um, again, this cycle is different. There are a lot of supply chain disruption, uh, housing uh, distortions, uh, labor market normalization. Um, I don't have time to go into details, but the view here is that you're gonna continue to see sequential inflation um, you know, hovering around uh, just above 2%, which will bring the young year number continuously lower. By June this year, uh, we think the Fed will be cutting um, in the cycle. And last slide on the US, how does our forecast compare to market pricing? Um, of course, there are different scenarios. Um, if the ref uh, inflation indeed start to move higher, uh, in contrary to our forecast, the Fed may be holding for longer than we forecast. That's the red line on the left-hand side. If the U.S. gets into recession, uh, then the Fed will be cutting more aggressively. That will be the gray line. But the weighted average can be compared to market pricing. The market is also pricing different scenarios, giving it different probabilities. And the point here being, the blue line is GS risk uh, weighted, the dashed blue line, uh, GS risk weighted um, uh, 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 rate path and it is below the market pricing of a uh, uh, red dotted line, uh, meaning that market is pricing fewer cuts than GS, and we think um, the Fed will be cut, cutting more than the market is expecting. Now switching gear to uh, China, uh, we also have a table, similar to Helen's table, uh, listing all the numbers. Uh, a lot of what Helen uh, described, uh, I agree. Uh, let me just go through the subsequent charts and perhaps just add on to what Helen already discussed. Uh, point number one, when Premier Li Qiang said this year target around 5%, but it's not easy to get, we agree. This chart shows why it's difficult to get to 5% growth, even though last year we had 5% growth. The reason is that two out of the five last year was one-off help from reopening. And you're not gonna get another one-off help from reopening this year. Um, so if you take out that 2%, that means you need to lift your growth from about uh, 3% to 5%. What's needed to get to that 5%? You need three things. You need to be lucky, meaning that exports cannot fall precipitously. Uh, you need to manage the housing downturn very well. Uh, we're base, uh, in our baseline, we're assuming housing becoming less drag to GDP growth. And then you need to do some work, meaning fiscal spending policy support need to add about uh, one percentage points uh, to your GDP growth. All three conditions, then you get to 5% growth. And Helen gave me this very difficult task of uh, covering housing, uh, and uh, I will take the challenge. Um, you know, when uh, in my previous life, I covered uh, U.S. housing and mortgages. So recently, we did a deep dive comparing U.S. housing and China housing. Um, there are a lot of reasons why the two are completely different, right? The developmental stage is very different. Urbanization rate, uh, per capita income, um, uh, and then you can argue that uh, even the mortgage system, housing system is very different. Right? In the U.S., you had a, um, you know, negative amortization, the very loose credit uh, standard, which wasn't the case in China. Um, but differences aside, once you're in the housing downturn, I think two things will happen. One is the price is going to decline for a while. It doesn't just rebound very quickly. This is because properties are transacted by individuals, not financial professionals. So once you look at your neighbor's prices, that's how you form your expectation of a prices, and that's how the next transaction's price is going to be set. So this is going to last a while. Uh, case in point, if you think about in the U.S. experience, house prices peaked in 2006. When did the house price drop in the U.S.? Despite all the firefighting, a very quick policy response in the U.S. End of 2011, beginning of 2012. 
So it lasts a while for price to adjust. And by this standard, we're only halfway through in the price adjustment. Number two, when housing is different than, say, you know, bubble tea or, um, you know, uh, 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 clothes, right? For those items, uh, let's say food, if you have an oversupply, the next year you don't have an oversupply anymore because it's just rotten and, and you throw it away. Housing lasts for decades. So the deleveraging and destocking process is going to take a very long time. That's why during the housing downturn in the U.S., people talk about let's just demolish all the extra inventory in Las Vegas, in Phoenix, because it doesn't go away by itself, right? So what we see in this chart, in China, property stars are down about 60% from the peak, um, which is closer to the bottom we saw in the U.S. But the point here is that you're going to stay low for a very long time as you clear out that excess inventory. Uh, so I think, um, you know, the, the title of the session is a bottom out, but from a housing point of view, we're not bottoming out. <laughs> but um, as uh, uh, Professor Lau was saying that not everything is bad, I think uh, uh, Nero was also talking about uh, the re renewable energy EV. The story is pretty impressive. The left-hand side chart shows you auto exports by country. The red line is China. It was nothing just a few years ago. And now it's number one in the world. So it is impressive. But uh, we don't think this uh, emerging industry is including uh, battery, um, solar, wind, and the EV uh, is going to completely fill that void left by property downturn. Why? Domestically, think about it. You create one EV, you destroy one traditional car. So the contribution to GDP is much smaller than you just build a property. Mathematically speaking, uh, it's not going to be the same. And uh, what about exports? Uh, you build an EV and export it, it will be a uh, contribution to GDP, but we are facing pushbacks. You can't expect the red line to continue to rise with no pushback from other countries. So. When we add up uh, the contribution from these new three sectors versus, and compare with the housing, the conclusion is that net-net is still a negative. Last slide, what does that mean? The government said they want a 5% growth, and uh, we all agree it's difficult. Uh, we went through all these different pieces, housing is going to be a big hole, and the new emerging industries are not going to be enough. What needs to happen? Policy needs to ease. So in this chart, we have an index that summarizes the monetary policy, fiscal policy, credit policy, and housing policy. The lower the number is, the more um, loosening or stimulus you get in the economy. So look at 2009, a big easing. That's your bazooka. Look at 2015-16, a big easing. Look at 2020 when we first had COVID, a big easing. And look at now, not so much. So we think of the style of easing these days in the pursuit of a higher quality growth so will be very different. We don't expect a repeat of 2009, 2015, and 2020. But this is not enough. We expect the policy to continue to ease. Um, end of the day, I think you have to make a choice. Either you ease policy to stimulate the economy or you let go of the 5% target. You can't have both. And our view is that once the target is set, uh, the government will try to reach that target, and therefore, we should accept, expect more easing. And this is similar to what Helen was saying, monetary, fiscal, and the like. Uh, I'll stop here and hand it over to the next speaker. Unlike the previous speakers, uh, Professor Lau is uh, famously doing economic forecasting. And then we have uh, the investment economists who are, who, who are kind of very on top of the recent events and what's going on about bubble teas and about tourism, <laughs> about movie going and so on. So as academic economist, I think uh, uh, we, I just couldn't handle all those things together. <laughs> uh, together. And but so we attend, uh, I'm not going to do any forecasting. So what I think the world uh, academic economists do is what we 
we write down all those and we, we kind of ten fables. It's kind of we simplify the, the reality and hopefully using the stories to tell some morals. So so I'm gonna tell you a story to start with. So the question we have is about growth slowdown. Right? So this is a you can see the China's growth and peaked in 2007 and started to slow down. It's, it's been a prolonged slowdown. So the fable I'm gonna tell is somewhere on Earth, there's an economy that was also slowing down. Right? So, and you can see also the, the con consumer act confidence was also declining. There's a lack of aggregate demand. So you can see, so this is a CPI, this, so this is actually zero, so the deflation. So that's, that's, that's a so guess where there is. And so the question is, how can we get all of this faltering economy? So, and in this economy, there's also very similarities. There's no consumption demand, and there's an important sector, that's a very important sector in the economy that's distressed. There's a lot of bad debt fault. And government's responses, fiscal, re fiscal stimulus, advocating increasing domestic demand, it was in fact. And also there was investment in infrastructure, it was still not in fact. So how, how did this economy get out of it? So that was China in 1995 to 2000. So after the Asian financial crisis, and then the distraction sector was the banking sector, with a huge amount of bad loans. And, and so all these fiscal monetary policies was not able to, to, to revitalize the economy, but China did revive. So growth restarted. So how did growth restarted? Through reforms, through economic reforms. So, so, so this is a, this is a, this is the, the numbers that we uh, quantitative analysis we did for 2000, 2005, for a paper that I, I had with uh, Trevor. Uh, so, but uh, let me just first talk about the reform that behind these the, numbers. So, first of all, the China joined the WTO, the trade liberalization, the national trade liberalization. But more importantly, there's a lot of discussion uh, internal trade barriers. And then there was relaxation of migration restrictions, and also there's a agricultural reform that have the land reforms that has confirmed the property, the user rights of land for farmers in 2001. And there's also co-privation of SOEs, and also the, the SOEs are withdrawing from the downstream manufacturing industries. The market was opening up, and then the the the. The, 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 the exporter, small exporter firms don't have to go through the SOE intermediaries, they can directly export. So there's all these liberalizations. And it's those reforms that lead to the growth. So if you look at the growth here, actually, import-export was not that important. So it's only consumer 4.5% of GDP growth. The national trade liberalization. The internal trade liberalization contributed more than double the international trade liberalization. And then the migration, and reform, reforming the cocoa system. And then the, the other reform that contributed to the, to the TFP here. So in other words, it's possible to get out of, of, of that kind of uh, faltering economy and revitalize it through the economic reform. And, and China did it in 2000, around 2000. And I think this is a general story. So every time when China was, was, was growing rapidly, it's because its productivity has been growing rapidly. So, so, the, so, the, so it's really the, the main driver for China's growth is TRP growth. So quite, and, and where does TRP growth come from? It's coming from the economic reforms. So here's another <coughs> uh, uh, chart that taken from a recent an ongoing research that I'm doing with some of my colleagues at Hong Kong U. So we're looking at the regions that are much more, have no, strong local initiatives. So, and so, so we call those bottom-up uh, regions. They, they tend to kind of come up with the reform themselves without the central government's approval. Sometimes even it's prohibited by central government. So the most famous uh, one is the household responsive system, the agricultural reform. And so these days, every, so I think we, we're, now we talk about the 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 the, 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 the yang hui. 
I think uh, what what was more th more more important is not what the central government said at Liang Hui, it's what the local government would, are doing. So in 1978, so everybody's talking about this important landmark event, the third plenum of the 11th Communist Party Congress. At, so as if that's the, the, the blueprint there about economic reform and opening up. First of all, that word was not in that doc, in the document, reform and opening up. It was it came out much later. And secondly, it did not talk about encouraging household economy systems. It was actually was banned. He said it, you, we should not do that. And but most importantly, it's not that it, it, it said the, the two things that are, are important in the document of that coming out of that Congress. First, they say we want to stop the political struggle. We want to focus on economic development. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that it, it's a our our decision process has been too centralized. We need to decentralize. And they even talk about separation of the government and the managers in, in, the, in the enterprises. So that's, that's a, that spirit, not the actual what the firm should do, what the farmers should do, but that spirit of encouraging local initiatives and created this atmosphere so that the bottom-up policy change was possible. So that is the household response system that started not in Xiaogangchun, with people always using Xiaogangchun as a, as, a, as a initial one, but it was actually started in many places, not only Xiaogangchun, and it's starting to spread across China. So by 1982, when finally the central government made the household responding system become the formal policy, probably 60-70% of China has already adopted that policy. So I think the, and what we show here is that the, lo the, the regions in China that tends to use the bottom-up policies tend to have higher GDP growth. But also, the, 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 the regions that was chosen by the central government as an experiment, so it's not a top-down policy, it's still kind of the central government wants to do some reform and then find some localities and do experiment. So we call the centrally sponsored uh, policy reforms. That also leads to GDP increases. But they have two, uh, part of the, the how the general GDP increases are different. So, for the bottom-up policies, they raise the productivity growth. For the centrally sponsored policies, TLP is negative. So the, so the, so the central government sponsored policies is through the capital accumulation. Where the bottom-up ones is improving the economic efficiency, which is those kind of growth are much more sustainable. So I think so, so. What I think about is that I, when we look at the, the, the announcement about the, the party's Congress or the, or the government's report, I guess uh, I'm, I'm not disappointed about lack of stimulus, lack of relaxation of monetary policy, lack of fiscal stimulus, and so on. But I'm, I'm disappointed about there's not anything saying about decentralization, about encouraging local initiatives. So that's. That's, that's the moral that I want, I want to say. So let me show you. So here's a very preliminary result and show how the central government policies uh, 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 characteristics have changed. So here we're taking all the central government policies related to economic reforms from, from 1979 to 2018. And so then we kind of using a text analysis to find the policies that originate from some county, really lowest level of administrative union. And so the percentage of policies that's originally from counties. You can see the rapid reform period are the periods where there's a lot of local initiatives. Now in contrast, the central government directives. So like I said, Huge increase in this. So, so, so why we, why we are in such a prolonged decline in growth, and which is the result of declining TP growth, is centralization. It's a lack of local initiative. So I guess the same my favor is that growth is driven by TP. 
And the bottom up policy changes are crucial for, for tier two growth. Have been important and should will be important. But the recent centralization policy making has not been helpful. And in order to reignite China's growth, we need more decentralization. Opportunity, I would like to say I'm very happy to see Professor Low today because I went to the Chinese University for my undergrad in 2008 and Professor Low was the president then. And I'm very grateful that the uh, Chinese University gave me the scholarship then. So that's the reason I can be here today. So very happy to see Professor Low. So I have two questions. So the first Just one. <laughs> okay, so uh, one question. So it's about the uh, labor supply in China because I uh, went back to my hometown for Chinese New Year and it's a small village in Jiangxi province. So many people there actually went to Wenzhou in Zhejiang working for manufacturing uh, plants there. And one thing I learned from them is that actually the uh, major labor, uh, working labor in manufacturing in Zhejiang already aged like 50 to 60 which means this uh, labor source would uh, retire gradually in the following 10 years. And for the younger generation, they have a very strong preference to work for the service industry, say um, restaurants or taxi driver or package delivery, because they think the working environment in manufacturing sector are too bad. So um, because as economics, uh, we usually start from the macro data, but if we um, look from this uh, difference among ages, would we actually see a much rapid decrease in manufacturing working labor in China than what the macro data tell us? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you are, you are one of our scholars um, because I actually started the uh, scholarship program from, sorry, from the mainland China. Is it out? Yeah. Um, you know, so, very good to see you. Um, I think we have to give this actually much more careful thought because um, the, we know today the service sector is the largest in China now, you know, about 58 percent, and manufacturing is only about 38 percent. Um, I'm not sure that uh, a very large service industry sector is actually good. I mean, you know that the U.S. is actually now trying to bring back manufacturing working very hard to pay. Uh, the, prob the problem is that uh, you know, it's very hard to develop high-paying jobs in the service sector. Some will, you know, the lawyers, doc you know, doctors in Hong Kong, they have very high salaries. But uh, waiters, uh, they don't get much of anything. Uh, even bank employees, unless they are very high, they don't get much of anything. So uh, the question really is that what kind of uh, labor market, what kind of uh, open mix uh, is China going to have uh, looking forward? I think many of my American friends, they are regretting that uh, they have basically, the, the auto industry used to be very strong uh, in the U.S., Detroit Big Three, and now it's really a terrible shape. Okay. And uh, so you really have to see, there are really no good jobs, very good manufacturing jobs for everybody. Um, one of the phenomena that you've seen in the U.S. are the supporters of uh, former President Trump. Okay. And if you look at the demographics, these are people who actually might have good jobs, you know, 40 years ago, and they really don't have any jobs any hopes. I mean, they don't care what Trump thinks, you know, how he behaves, right? But they are just unhappy. And they don't think the government has done anything for them. And, and I think that is probably something uh, we need to avoid. Um, you know, that uh, China, I've been advocating this, and China has been trying to allow people to move 
I mean, the, the, the who call, household registration is now much more relaxed today. But I think the bottleneck is something that you won't expect uh, because uh, it is actually the rural laborers who do not want to have a hukou in Shanghai or Wenzhou, right? Why? Because that means they have to give up, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what they have, you know, they have uh, titles to their home and so forth. They have to give up the registration in their own house. They only have one. Uh, one you can, any Chinese citizen can only have one household registration at one place at any one time. Okay, so I think that is actually uh, the resistance now come from the labor themselves. It used to come from the local authorities. They don't want to have too many red. So I think that has to be, it really has to be thought through. But um, I don't really think China has a, will have a labor shortage problem. Um, you look at some of the uh, Chinese enterprises, they are all actually very automated. They are automated to such a surprising extent Right, that uh, you actually worry that they would uh, substitute, they would <laughs> take away jobs as opposed to needing more labor. Thank you. I think I'll probably agree with uh, Professor Lau on this issue. Uh, I do think China has an aging issue, but not the uh, labor shortage issue. Yeah. Because particularly with the uh, technology revolution, uh, China will not repeat what happened to Japan. Or the short Yeah, I, I kind of agree. So uh, I guess uh, in the U.S., if you look at the evidence that the, the states that uh, aging faster, they, they, I mean, the, the adoption of the robots uh, faster, and actually productivity was going faster than the states that the uh, aging Okay, Brian. Make <laughs> Hi, hello, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Brian Wong. I'm a fellow affiliated with the Centre and I also teach and research philosophy, uh, so not an economist here. My quick question is, if I look at China's priorities today, you've got a potentially hostile rival and a competitor, you've got concerns about infiltration and national security, you've got a need to modernise the military, redistribution, sustainability, ESG, all of that. So realistically, if I could ask you to quantify this on a list of priorities for Chinese leaders, uh, whether it be from the first to third, or you know, fourth to sixth, or sixth all the way to twentieth, how important is GDP growth relative to all of these other considerations? Especially look at Zhu Xiaodong professor's uh, stats just then about centralization. If I, as a policymaker, want to prioritize centralization, control, top-down decision making, I might say that's more important than GDP growth, and so be it if we can't hit the target. So to speak. So it's just a hypothetical question here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Go ahead. I, I kind of agree with what, what your question. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, unlike in 1978, when China was really poor, and, and then when the Chinese leaders visited uh, Japan, visited Singapore and the US, and feel really uh, behind. And now we have more confident leaders. And also, after 40 years of growth, that we have accumulated a lot of wealth and a lot of resources. So I think the urgency is not as uh, strong. Yeah, so that's. Uh, so I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, the, uh, I think it's important. You think that even for the Chinese government, GDP growth is not the end in itself. Okay, I mean that is really something you should recognize. And for the last couple of years, they really talk about emphasizing the quality of growth rather than the quantity of growth. And if you look at quality of growth, uh, there are many things you can look at. It's really tremendous improvements in the, in the last 10, 15, 20 years in everything, environment, education, uh, life expectancy, health care, and so forth. But having said that, I think that the uh, governments basically really should try to uh, improve people's welfare. Right? And uh, you need to have the wherewithal to provide for the health care and to provide for the national defense 
mm -hmm. for everything else. And that actually requires GDP. Okay, if you actually think about why is the U.S. so intent on suppressing Chinese growth, I think the short answer is that our GDP is going too fast. And, and the same thing happened to Japan when in the, uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, I don't know whether you heard of Professor Ezra Vogel. He actually wrote a book. Actually, the yeah, original title, Japan is Number One. Yeah, and he published it uh, under the change title, Japan as Number One. <laughs> Big difference, <laughs> right? But, uh, but I think the U.S. will not tolerate people to say no. Uh, there is a, uh, there, are, there are two Japanese authors that wrote a book. I said Japan can say no. I think it's Morita-san and also uh, Shintaro. Uh, and they basically said the same thing. That is, now why wouldn't the U.S. let people say no? Okay, because the U.S. want to remain the so hegemon. If I were the so hegemon, and Helen says no and goes unpunished, <laughs> all of you will stop listening to me. Right? So I will do all I can to make sure that, uh, to suppress <laughs> Helen. Unless one day I try everything else and nothing seems to work. Then I'll sit down with Helen and say, okay, we'll divide the territory. <laughs> I think, but well, we're not at that point yet. Okay, we're not at that point yet. So, so anyway, I hope that answers your question. I, uh, very, my assessment is that for China to have a quick economic reform, bounce back is not that easy. I think the strategy now is different. Uh, the uh, uh, growth is important, but as uh, Professor Lau has mentioned, the quality is also important, particularly now when we go through this uh, transformation to put an emphasis on the development of high technology, the advanced sector. So I don't think uh, there'll be quick uh, bounce back uh, in near term, maybe three, four, five years. Okay, probably I need to go to what? <laughs> I think the, the, the gentleman in the back. Uh, I come back. I'll go that, that side. Thank you. I'm a PhD student here at HKU, and I have a question for Ms. Shanghui. So at the bottom of your talk, you mentioned that housing or housing stock, if I catch it correctly, is reaching the bottom, but we are not bottoming out for years. And could you elaborate a bit more on that? And also, what do you think the future scenarios will be? Like, for example, say, where do you think we'll be in 10 years? Thank you. That's a really hard question. Um, well, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, forecasting out for one quarter is hard enough. Forecasting out for 10 years is hard. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of times people emphasize that China is different. Uh, but as economists, we always come back and try to figure out what are the things that that's common that we can predict. So the point I'm trying to make is that housing is extremely durable. So to destock, you look at the pipeline, you look at the developers' uh, book, how much is under construction, how much they haven't sold. Uh, is enormous. So that's why if, if you don't do anything, it's going to last a really long time to destock and uh, to restart. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't rebound. Uh, I, I was mentioning that, um, you know, in the U.S., at a certain point, people are talking about just demolishing certain properties. And in China as well, there are some creative suggestions. Can we just say anything that's constructed before 1980s is substandard and you cannot live there? You can instantaneously remove a whole chunk of a housing stock. Um, so yeah, th this is why it really hinges. The, the fundamental uh, economic theory will say uh, it could potentially be a, a very long process, but at the same time, it really depends on what the government does. I think the housing sector is not going to come back in China. The, uh, if you really think about it long term, um, you have single child, you know, single son, marrying single daughter, and they would inherit 
of the houses of the parents. So I, I think there will be a surplus of households going forward for a while. You know, even independently of the crash in the housing market. But I think the, that model is over. The model of uh, local developers. Uh, and I mean, basically, if you really think about it, um, the local governments in China, or 2,000 of them, they basically took in the page from Hong Kong. Right? Because they don't have resources, and the only resource they control is land. So, okay, so I see a developer friend, Xiaodong, Okay, I said, look, I'll give you the piece of land. I need a hospital, I need a school. You do it, <laughs> right? And so lots of people get rich because they basically got assigned land. But I think that model has run out. It can never be again. And I think it's a really a mistake, a uh, failure in supervision and regulation that they have allowed so many pre-purchased -pre flats to go into default, you know, uh, uh, my lot far. And you know, in, in Hong Kong in the 50s, it actually happened. Even today, you still get my lot far. But in the 50s, they operated like, uh, like China today. Your money doesn't go into escrow. I say, you are the developer, I would I, I said, I want to buy this flat in your development. I pay right away. And you take the money, right? And, and, and Hong Kong has since changed the rules. So the money has to go into an escrow. It's only when you can deliver the occupancy permit and you can go to the bank and take the money out. For reasons I don't understand, that China never had this system for 20 years. They should have. If they had this system, the problem would be much would be much better. It still would be bad, but it would be still be. And, and I think that's a, basically a failure of the supervision and regulation. Okay, let's come to this side. Please. Hi, I'm Xin Sun from King's College London at HKU. Um, this might be more of a political question than an economics one, but there was mention of the modern trends of decoupling and sanctions. I think there was mention of Professor Leo about the, um, the death of globalism. Do you believe this is a temporary phase, or do you think that it's going to be that we're going to phase out, go back to liberalism, or is this a permanent shift in the world economy towards protectionism? <laughs> Well, um, uh, the, uh, well, let me begin by saying the following. Um, globalization, economic globalization, was great. Okay? And China actually has been a major beneficiary of economic globalization. Yeah. No doubt about it. But, uh, but, we, but most people uh, do not really understand, do not know that under globalization, even though all countries are better off, there will be winners and losers in every country. And it is the responsibility of the government to take care of the losers. The market takes care of the winners, but the government has to take care of losers. Now, where do we see the losers in China? The losers were, for example, the workers. The Xiaoga. They were laid off. They were, I don't know, there, I think there were uh, tens of millions at least of people being laid off in China. Right? But the government took care of them. It didn't become a social problem. They took care of them. So first point is that now the globalization is doing the opposite. Okay. Um, again, I mean everyone all countries are worse off, but then also in every country you create winners and losers. Okay, you know, I mean, the global, uh, what you call it, the risk can be couple, it doesn't matter. But that would create both winners and losers right, in, the same, in, in, in the same way. So we have to recognize that. So it's not all bad in either direction, or all good in either direction, all right? 
But um, I actually believe that uh, for the sake of economic resilience, we ought to have more than one supply chain. Okay. Now, if you think back about Shanghai in 2022, Shanghai shuts down because of COVID, okay, unfortunately. Um, but that shuts down half the country, more than half the country. Why? Because most of the supply chains at the time would run through Shanghai one way or the other. Either they are imported or they are manufactured nearby provinces. So once it shuts down, what can you do? Everybody has to shut down. I think that actually, if you look at it carefully, the 2022 data, that's exactly what, what happened. Okay? And that's really why I advocated that you should have two supply chains, at least for a large country, like China, said China to establish another one near Chongqing, so that when something happens, you can still have another chain to rely on. But in the long run, uh, it is actually good for everybody to have two supply chains or more, right? Because the competition will lower the prices, increase quality, and so forth. You know, I mean, so so that the although in the short term you get cut off, uh, it's a little bit painful, right? <laughs> but then you have to work hard um, to try to uh, work around it, right? And I think. Uh, in some sense, somebody mentioned Huawei, and Huawei actually managed to work around it a little bit. Right? Um, so, so eventually, what would happen is that uh, you know, whoever restricting the uh, technology would say, oh, they, have, they can make it themselves anyway. Why should we put a limit? Right? You know, and then prices would begin to come down. Quality will come through. Quality will improve. So, so that that is in that sense, I'm not uh, too worried. I always believe in diversification. You see, it can be, it may not be just geopolitical risk. It could be a tsunami, an earthquake, an epidemic, right? And so forth. So, why put all your eggs in one basket? Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed your question because we're discussing maybe we extend this journey at session two, five o'clock. So um, I try to also reply your question uh, briefly. Uh, to me, um, this so-called the uh, post-Cold War globalization is dead. Uh, I, very, I feel very sad to see it's gone. Uh, to me now, is I call it post-COVID uh, globalization. It's very different from post-Cold globalization. And uh, I think it's, uh, it will last for a long time. If we talk about the uh, post-Cold uh, War globalization, it lasts about 30 years. If I talk about from 1990 to uh, 2021 or 2022, it's about 30 years. So this also, the post-Cold post globalization will also last another 30 years. In particular, we look at the uh, US-China relation. We talk about Nixon coming to visit Shanghai. That was 1972. Then 2022, there was lockdown in Shanghai. That dramatically changed Western, Western perception about China, unfortunately. So that, how long does that last? How long does it last? Last about 40 years. So this kind of uh, uh, robbery between US China also can last 40 years. You know, think about Soviet Union and uh, the, the, the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the US. Also, it will start from 1945 to 1990 when collapsed when somebody collapsed, it was not if, another more than 40 years. So I don't have that positive aspect of the US-China relation in the near term. Of course, these two superpowers must coexist. If they don't coexist and build a better relation, then the whole world will be uh, affected. So from the bottom of my heart, these two countries need build better relations. OK, that's great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I have a question, but also I want to go back to Brian Wang's question. I think not sufficiently answered. My question, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for a fantastic panel. I don't want a great deal. It's really 
so high level you know communication and also great data you know you share. I have a question for um, Professor Lau, and uh, you mentioned you actually make a very convincing case on the two the benefit of the two supply chains. But based on your logic, could you say the same thing is also beneficial for two IT system, two currency systems, and the two data system that some people initiated? The question for um, Brian, I hope that uh, if I may, I, again, it's his question, to ask uh, each of the panelists to give one single suggestion for policy makers in Beijing, how to deal with China's current challenges and what the way to bottom up. <laughs> I would not just say two systems. There should be more systems. I mean, you know, as long as they can survive. Uh, you would never want to a monopoly. You never want any country to a monopoly. Uh, I don't know if many people know, but uh, years ago, there is a Chinese ship that was relying on GPS you know, system. And in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the U.S. turned it off, and the ship was sort of wandering around for about a month. I don't know why it took that long, but, but that really tells you you cannot have a single system. You cannot. Right. Now, I, I think the same with currency system. I actually, I've been advocating a currency system that actually goes back to Bretton Woods. Because if you think about it this way, let's say Cheng and I, we trade. Why do we need to, I change my currency in the US dollars and pay you, and you change the US dollars back to your currency? I mean, why do we need two transactions? Right? The, only, the only people who benefit is JP Morgan Chase. <laughs> right. So, so I think what we ought to be looking back to is to have own currency settlement. I don't, I'm not advocating a remnant set system either. There's really no reason why uh, Thailand and Indonesia trading, why they should use the remnant B. Why, why can't they just use their own currencies? Right. So, so I, think, I think what we really need to do is to, really to go back to a system that is much more independent. Uh, doesn't rely on a single currency. I'm not advocating MNB or any other currency. But uh, but you know, but that, if you only have one currency system, you are at the mercy of the country that controls it. Okay, I mean, that is how they could cut off Soviet Union or I mean, Russia in, in the in the in the war uh, Russia. Ukraine war, right? And um, he's in Switzerland. <laughs> you know, I, th I think it was probably not probably in the stick for Switzerland. In Switzerland, they tried to uh, confiscate Russia, freeze at least freeze Russian assets. So I think for everything, it's best to have more than one system. You know, why, why stop at two? Why not three or four? Because I think that actually, uh, that actually leads up to a much more multipolar world. And that is really what I think we should work at, is a multipolar world rather than a unipolar world. Thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, also has a second question. Yeah, so, so I'm all for all of us. Yeah. I don't know, Professor Lau? Oh. Um, I, I think Chinese government should do is to do something that will change people's expectations about the future. Because if you don't have positive expectations about the future, you will not consume, and you will not invest. In. Okay, I mean, I, and, and so that's the way to bring back aggregate demand. <coughs> and let me give you an example of how changing expectations can work. You all remember in 1992, early 1992, um, 
Chinese economy was not doing anything. Very quiet. Okay, and because of uh, what happened uh, on June 4th, right, it's very, very quiet. And what happened is that Mr. Dung, I shall be, he visited uh, Shenzhen to South, you know, Southern Tour, and he basically said, that you have to develop. And then everyone sort of responded very positively. And from 1992 to 1995, 96, it's really a boom year. If you want to ask me, can I see anything from the economic indicators? I said no. It's entirely a matter of people's expectation uh, at the internal market. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so since uh, Professor Lau talked about 92, so that, and, uh, to answer your second question, so I, I have the same thing. That, uh, I think there's another important quote from Deng Xiaoping, and because there was uh, there was hesitation about uh, planning or reform, deepening market reform at the top <laughs> back then. So Deng Xiaoping said, "Who doesn't reform should will lose the job." So, so I think uh, now with lack of confidence, I think uh, I have a wish. I don't, know if, I don't think the wish will be granted. But uh, my wish is that uh, you, 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 you already says who doesn't support the private enterprises should lose the job. I think that will be where you can release the, 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 I mean, I have strong confidence about Chinese people. I mean, five years ago, nobody knew Ch EV will so so bad. And Chinese entrepreneurs, Chinese local government officials have enormous creativity and drive and hard working. So uh, how we kind of unleash that force and that creativity, I think that's what we need. Uh, back to your first question, uh, I, I, I also kind of agree with Professor Law. I think uh, if China has followed uh, Jeffrey Sachs in terms of economic reform in 1978, probably would be in trouble. <laughs> the, 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 the growth there. So, so I think uh, there's no uniform way. So I think uh, I, I'm emphasizing about bottom up change within China, but I think uh, for the world it should be the same thing. Right? There should be no one country monopolized on what kind of system should be. And you should let, uh, as long as you respect some basic. Uh, human decency uh, should allow the different places to experiment different. I think that that's uh, uh, I think that's generally more likely to be successful for the world. Um, sure. Uh, in terms of policy, uh, I, I agree that expectations are very important. How to lift that confidence for private entrepreneurs, for consumers. Uh, and then uh, get out of deflation uh, because we're deleveraging and uh, uh, deflation is not helpful when you're trying to reduce debt. Uh, I think at a actionable or concrete level, I think there are some sort of uh, uh, obvious things that the government could do, um, regardless of whether you think a cyclical, you know, big uh, fiscal stimulus is the right answer or structural reform is the right answer. I think there are certain obvious things that the government should be doing, for example, communication. I don't think the communication over the past few years have been very satisfactory. Uh, the latest two sessions, when they just announced that we're not doing the premier press conference anymore, uh, my offshore clients were uh, you know, interpreting it that uh, very negatively. I think the government could have done a better job communicating. Uh, I think, uh, uh, for example, the local governments are facing so much pressure, uh, you kind of understand that they're deleveraging, but to the extent that local governments are being reported uh, cutting salaries on teachers and policemen, and then local governments are, you know, doing uh, collecting more fines to make up the losses. That generate a negative feedback loop, hurting the economy. I think though we need to stop those negative feedback loop. That's a pretty uh, obvious thing to do. Uh, and what Professor Lau was saying, complete those properties or return the money to people who put their down payment and not getting anything back for who knows how many years. We need to stop that and do something more forcefully. I think those are concrete actions uh, we can all agree upon and, and, and implement it quickly. Um, I 
would like to uh, probably echo what Professor Lau said about expectation. I think I do think that expectation is probably underappreciated, and probably in economic uh, theoretical models, we should have uh, you know, done a better job of uh, putting that in. Um, but I think what I was hoping to see, um, if we may put through some work to Beijing, is probably the, exactly the opposite of what Professor Zhu suggested, which is I hope to see a little bit more encouragement positive incentives for people to do things rather than negative incentives. I think there have been too many negative incentives in the recent past. If you do this, you know, okay, we will, we will arrest you. Uh, so if we come back, we will arrest you too. Uh, we will cut your pay if you don't do, you know, if you do that. Actually, what about uh, some positive incentives? If I do something, if there is some potential payout for me going into the I think the true success, if you look at the, uh, um, you know, which is for SOEs and also government officials in the past uh, you know, 40 years, to a large extent, the reason why reforms can be done was not because we threatened them, okay, if you don't do reform, you go away. Instead, I think it is actually more about if you do this, what is the payoff for you, for the people that you work for, and for your region. And I think that's actually more for uh, productivity gains for, for overall speaking and for TFP growth that the Professor Drew was, uh, um, was talking about. And also, I would say China as probably the only country in the world mentions TFP growth as the top priority uh, in their Congress report, right? Uh, as an economist, I'm very flattered. Um, but uh, I would say that, you know, which out of all these societies, which ones worked the worst, right? It's probably slavery. It's because there was no positive incentive for slaves to do anything, right? Because if you don't do it well, you will be whipped, you will be killed. But if you do something well, what is the payout? Nothing, right, because you're a slave. So unfortunately, we don't think that we should go down that path, and we believe that a better, more transparent, positive incentive system would probably bring better goods for uh, the, the economy and the this world. I think nothing more important than, again, the confidence. Because the problem now in China is the lack of confidence. In terms of consumer consumption, we all know that Chinese people, their, their the, uh, saving rate is higher more than EU and the United States combined. So they have money. It's not they don't have money, but they don't have confidence. And same with the entrepreneurs. They all have wish to invest more but they don't know what kind of policy they will face. So policy is not being consistent. What happened to China over the last few years? We know what happened to the internet, the companies. We know what happened to the uh, education training companies. We also know what happened to re real estate sector. Although we all know that real estate sector has problem for a long time. But the policy change also hit the sector very hard. So the most important thing, consistent policy and uh, to gain the confidence back. Another important thing is we talk about 1992. I remember in early 2022, I wrote an article uh, right before the uh, 30th anniversary, 30 anniversary of uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, visit to so I said, China needs to have third time opening up policy. The first time was 1978, second one was 1992. We all knew that after 1989, China's economy was so bad, right? But after 1992, the southern trip by the Xiaoping, China jumped up rapidly. So we do need third time open up. With that, I think China will have much, much faster growth. Thank you. I think And uh, as Chinese saying, uh, the great banquet has come to end. So we have to finish this uh, banquet. Thank you for the sharing. We have a small here. It's a CCW.